This is the Ideas Podcast, the show where L&D professionals discuss ideas over a nice cup of tea. Warning, other beverages may be consumed. In this episode, I chat with Gemma Wells, Digital Program Manager at the Opportunity Group and Chair of the Learning Network. We discuss the role of networking in her L&D career and how we can all use it to supercharge our careers. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ideas Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. With us today uh, is Gemma. Gemma Wells, thank you so much for making the time to come and uh, and chat. Hi, you're more than welcome. I'm very excited to be here. Cool. So so I've had the pleasure of working with Gemma as she is the chairperson of the Learning Network. Um, You do lots of other things as well, though, that we'll dive into today. Um, But very on brand for the Learning Network, we are we're touching on networking in L&D, which I think I think we're both kind of in at least initially in agreement on the uh, how we've benefited from it. I know certainly it's played a huge role in my career, Um, but we'll we'll dive properly into that very very soon uh, but first things first we kind of masquerade we have a thin veneer of this being an l d podcast um but really people tune in to find out what people are drinking um so for me um i very rapidly went and found what's in the house turns out seven up seven up is what we have in the house today it was very very disappointing i must say um it may only be thursday but it it feels like six o'clock on a friday at this point yeah. this week for me. <laughs> and what about yourself Gemma? Um, so I'm very boring. I have a glass of lemon water. Oh, there you go. We've both gone citrus at least. That's, that's a, good, a theme. good start. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so before we get started, before we dive into networking, um, I always like to let people introduce themselves because otherwise I just make stuff up and people get very unhappy about it. Um, so what should we know about you, Gemma? What should you know about Gemma? So as you've alluded to, I am the chairperson of the Learning Network, um, a network which is very close to my heart, which we can talk about shortly, I'm sure. Um, I also work for an apprenticeship company called the Opportunity Group. Um, I look after all their um, digital programs, which is super exciting and something that I'm very fond of. Um, And I guess the only other thing to share is I'm a huge Star Wars geek. So much to the fact that I have tattoos of Star Wars on my person because I love them that much. <laughs> this is excellent. Unfortunately, I've reorganised the office since I started doing these. We did have um, the Red 5 helmet behind me for a while. Oh, um, nice. But uh, sadly, that's now on top of the bookcase, so you can't <laughs> actually see it. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. But I've got Optimus Prime on my desk, so we're fine. There's at least a That's certain degree good. of... Uh, it makes me happy to look over there and see him anyway. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> we kind of b- both touched on it now, so let's uh, let's go for the, the elephant in the room straight away, shall we? The Learning Network. Um, yes. This is not an advert or a paid advert for the Learning no. Network. I should stress that point. Um, first of all, we don't do paid advertising. And uh, second of all... <laughs> Um, you don't really have to, um, because I no. think it, it's a great place to start when we're talking about L&D networking and the impact it's had. So you mentioned how the Learning Network specifically was very close to your heart. Why is that? Why, why are you so passionate about it? So I guess when I started on my L&D journey 11, 11 12 years ago now, wow, um, I was kind of very much new to the game so to speak and I started off in facilitation sort of back in the day stand-up classroom um training which I loved I really did love but I kind of grew tired of delivering somebody else's material which then sort of spurred me into the design world um but I was very much alone because we were sort of few and far between where I worked at the time as designers. There just wasn't that many of us. And then as I sort of dipped my toe in the digital design world, that was like even smaller pool of people that like even designed digitally. So I felt very much sort of um, kind of like on my own and I felt like I was making it up a lot of the time. So I discovered the learning network <sighs> Well, it was the ELM back then, the e-learning network, about six years ago. Um, and it was just so nice to find a group of people that just, they just got me. And you could almost, like, I got matched up with um, a mentor um, and 
she just talked me through like all of this design techniques and I was like big light bulb moment and it was just it was just ping right somebody gets me I can talk to these people I can pick ideas from these people I can learn from these people and since then I've just um I've just never left the network (laughs) I just keep coming back and then I joined the board four years ago now um and it's just such a passion of mine to sort of see new people join the network and get so much from it because it is such it's such a big world digital learning now it's huge it's much bigger than it was when I started and I think sometimes you can go from when it's due to you you can go from not knowing anything to there being so much to learn that it almost feels overwhelming so I think having that network of people where you know you can go to such and such body without x and it's just nice to know that there's people out there that you can call upon to sort of build your knowledge and skills, really. That's why it's such a, a fond place for me. Yeah, I think it's interesting because certainly when I start, yeah. when I sort of joined, as I say, at the time, the ELN, um, my big issue was the fact that I kind of, I had cottoned on to the fact that networking was going to be super important. I needed to do more of it i would learn more i'd have a better career etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm just really bad at it snap um, like... totally get it i am i'm awful <laughs> at it because i get really nervous i don't want to sound like an idiot i think that's where my issue is i just think all oh, these people know so much and they're so clever but i don't know that much and i just you just worry don't you that you're going to say the wrong thing look like a complete loon and nobody will want to talk to you <laughs> This, well, this, this, this is exactly it. And I think it was, um, yeah, for me, I know it was like, it was the first connect that I went to. It was probably the first time where it was like, and now talk to strangers. It was like, kind of, uh, 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 what? <laughs> but then within about 10 minutes, you realize, oh, hang on, wait, everyone's feeling exactly the same way as me right now. Um, mm-hmm. Which in my head, I go, that's ridiculous. You, you know, you've got a PhD in this or you've done this for 20 years or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, but then you realize it's just very human to have that moment of, oh, I've got to talk to people I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I think well, it, it was great for getting me over that, um, which you know, shortly after that is when I went, right, I'm going to start a podcast because um, I, I can still be bad at networking, but disguise it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's all the front all the front <laughs> this, this, this is all about helping other people it's not just an opportunity to go come and tell me things that I should learn <laughs> and I just go off and read things afterwards it's great I like it um, so sort of broadening up from just the learning network then in terms of networking in your career uh, what kind of impact has it had and you know I think when you start networking one of those initial questions is how soon should I or well, should I be expecting to see a return from my efforts in networking? Yeah, no, it's it's funny because it took me a while because like like you described there with Connect, it I always used to sort of sit on the fence and kind of loiter on the sidelines to see what other people were talking about and chip in if I, I thought I had something worthwhile. So it did take me a while, yeah. I have to admit. I wasn't sort of quick off the mark with sort of it advancing my career or even advancing my confidence, I think, was the starting point. Um, Because as I said before, I've always had in the back of my mind, there's that whole, everybody says it and it's a big thing, but there's the whole imposter syndrome lurking at the back and you think, oh, am I really as clued up as these guys? Am I just like winging it? That is my favourite phrase. I am winging it every day is is literally my mantra and I live by this. But I think, I guess... Since joining the board particularly, I think that was the biggest sort of shift because I I joined the board as a a director and I started to look after things like events, um, which is big. So I I kind of thought, go big or go home kind of situation because if you're looking after an event, then you kind of need to network and you kind of need to talk to people. Um, So I think that was probably the biggest shift when I first started to do that. And then you just, I just kind of felt my confidence sort of growing and I started to think, all right, I'm not too bad at this. I, I, maybe I do kind of know what I'm talking about to a degree. There's still a lot for me to learn, but I think, I think that's the beauty of L&D. You're never 100% topped up with knowledge. I think it's something that you, you can always layer onto yourself. And I just I think that's where... I think that's where it kind of came from for me was was having that confidence to just join the board and just say yes. 
that that's like a really big thing for me. Just say yes to things. What's the worst that can happen? Um, and especially this last year, if I'm honest with you, if you'd have asked me to do a podcast this time last year, it would have been a big, nah, nah, I can't do that. Um, so yeah, this last sort of 12 months since making the leap into um, a new job during a pandemic, crazy times, um, and taking the sort of chair role at the, the Learning Network, I've seen myself grow. And I've seen my confidence rise and, and I can definitely hand on heart 100% say that building that strong, solid network around me has, has contributed to that massively. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's uh, I, I think it's quite often seen as that that initial kind of challenge to get into networking, I think, is overcut like when that confidence level just needs to overcome that fear level. Um, yeah. with just that first conversation or mm. as you say being willing to take on something that maybe at the time feels like it's a big scary thing or it almost feels like it might be too much yeah. um so it's quite interesting I think to um to go from kind of like oh not you know I'm not that confident in networking to I'm gonna join the board is a, <laughs> yeah, it's, a big leap. <laughs> it's kind of like it's a big jump but I wonder if that that's maybe part of the challenge is that if you do tiny little incremental steps it logically makes sense but you never have that moment that pushes you to go go for it because you always yeah. have a retreat option once you're for instance on the board or committed to something whether it's a mm. mentoring relationship or a, or get, just going to an event a face-to-face -face event once yeah. you're committed it's far more difficult to go Oh, actually, I'm not. I, you know, I'm going to back out. You know? Yeah, no, you, you're 100% right. And it's funny because um, a couple of months ago, I took my, my daughter, my middle daughter, Phoebe, she's 10. She's just recently got into playing rugby. Doesn't do my heart or nerves any good, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but she's, um, we're quite a, a big family for watching rugby league so she's she's always had it in her life but she's she went to um a women's rugby festival and she got to meet a couple of the women players and there was one player that stuck in her mind and, and to be fair she stuck in my mind and I always think about what she said in her little talk um she, a lady called Courtney Winfield Hill so she plays for the Leeds women's team and she said to Phoebe when she met her and she did her autograph she was talking to her about, oh, are you going to sign up for a rugby team? And she said, yeah, yeah I'm going to play. I'm going to play. Um, I just need to build my confidence. And um, she said, oh, all you need to do is just say yes. Just say yes to everything because what's the worst that can happen? And funnily enough, with what you've just said, then that's what came to my mind because it is, it's one of those things where you've just got to say yes and you've just got to take that leap of faith and just believe that, you know, you've built up that much of a network and that much confidence around you that you think what's the worst that can happen let's just do it let's just be bold and brave because if you do take those baby steps which it's fine to take those baby steps but you've just got to trust yourself I think and know that you can you can do it no I like that yeah I, I, I guess that's the thing about the, the kind of smaller steps is it's still about I guess saying yes on those it's just about yes. knowing that you're gonna have to say yes a lot more times maybe yeah um, to get the same progress that you are on those big jumps uh, but I think that's it's one of those interestingly very simple bits of advice yeah but it goes a long way <laughs> it does and it um, has stuck with both of us I think so I think that's mm. kind of nice that it is it's dead simple just say yes mm. but I think like I say it in my head now like oh do you want to do this interview um for the for something Gemma yeah yes I do want to do it and then inside I'm thinking oh my days what have I agreed to but it is it's that it's that just that confidence piece isn't it yeah it say yes and figure out the rest later I always <laughs> yeah. quite like that <laughs> but but again you sort of wonder how many how many amazing things in the world wouldn't have happened or wouldn't exist if someone hadn't just gone yeah sure we can do that and then walked away going oh my god how are we gonna make this happen um <laughs> It's true that. It's very true. Currently describing every meeting I attend. Um, <laughs> I can second that. Um, so I, I guess kind of attached to this, and I think the topic gets a lot of discussion, especially at the moment, and I don't want to say especially in our industry, but I think because it relates to things that we are asked to help a business overcome, we talk about it a lot more. Um, and that's kind of imposter syndrome and maybe some of the – I always kind of separate – kind of anxiety from imposter syndrome because it has 
there, there are certain differences, I would say. Yeah. Um, but I think both play a very big role in in, in networking and in career progression as a whole. Hmm. So, I mean, what are you, I guess just to start it off, what are your kind of initial thoughts when we're having discussions around imposter syndrome? Do you think? This is interesting. So, do you think L and D has had a positive impact on that in workplaces? Um, I think it has. I think there's still a lot to do. Um, I think just there's there's a lot of sort of we use the word again networks. There's a lot of networks yeah. around the, in L and D. Um, obviously, the learning networks are not the only one. There's there's a lot of them them around in the L and D, and I think that's the beauty of L and D. We are such a tight knit group that things like imposter syndrome can be supported better with it because mm. we've all experienced it at some point in our life. Um, you know, you might not call it out as imposter syndrome, you might call it out as something different. But I think we've all experienced it in an L and D capacity. So I think the beauty of L and D is that because we're such a, a close knit community almost, it kind of it helps you to overcome the imposter syndrome because you know that there's other people that you can sort of go to for advice and help. So I definitely think it's it's help, but I still think there's a lot to do with it. I think it's always going to be there. Um, I think it's always going to be something that's talked about. Yeah, and it's interesting because I always remember kind of um, early in my L&D career working in the contact centre, and it was surprising how many people would kind of exhibit all those things about not necessarily a job that's you know, what might be considered a high level of achievement job to go oh wow yeah. you're the such and such or such and such or whatever they were just working in a contact center um they they it weren't that they were they were going i don't deserve this job which i think is sometimes where the conversation goes yeah. it's more just a case of oh I, I you know i can't do it or i'm not good enough or whatever it might be um and it's interesting to see how that parallel doesn't change whether you're working in a contact center or you're the new head of learning or CEO for a company. Um, and yeah. part of me does wonder, not to the point where it's debilitating, but is it good? Like, should we worry the day that we go, I have absolutely no nervousness about this whatsoever? Um, is that not the sign of either the job is too easy for you or that you're ready for something else? Or mm. that maybe you don't care enough about what you're doing? <clears throat> That's what I was going to say. I think sometimes it could be that that you're not passionate. You've, you've almost lost your passion mm. for it at that point, I think. I think I think if you can recognise imposter syndrome and you can recognise that there is some nervousness, I think that the key is failure is okay it's okay to to not be 100 percent great at everything and i think that's i think that's the hurdle that a lot of people have got to get over they've almost got to show that vulnerability and i think that's a massive thing people don't like to show that they're vulnerable but i think you need to because it's a it's a human it's a human thing isn't it you, you've all got that vulnerability in us we're never 100 percent you know, happy with everything that we do. I mean, God, I'd look back at some of the e-learns I did when I first started and I go, whoa, Jen, what were you thinking? What is this? <laughs> that feeling. And that's because you've you've got that passion. You've, you've got that passion to sort of always want to improve. And I think if we can overcome the, the imposter syndrome tag, yeah. because I kind of feel like that tagline gives, makes you feel like it's a bad thing. I think if we could almost spin it on its head that it's not imposter syndrome, it's more of a vulnerability and it's okay to show that, I think that's that's a different way to look at it. And I think it's always, it, it goes back to you never having 100% knowledge on anything. You're always layering that knowledge. And I think if you can look at it in that sense, which is what I try to do now, rather than think, oh my God, no, I totally have no knowledge on this. I'd rather go away and build my knowledge on it and then come back rather than just completely write it off as, no, can't do that. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because I think one thing I think I've picked up from the sort of networking experience very quickly is the fact that, especially nowadays, knowledge is never far away. Yeah. <sighs> You know, uh, you know, wait, wait, and granted, you're not going to become an expert with a 15 minute Google. Of course, <laughs> no. you're not. Um, nor if you read five or six books on a topic. But it doesn't take a huge amount of effort now to get yeah. at least an understanding of the conversation and where we're at and and to be able to dive in. Um, mm. And certainly I think that's one of the things that I sort of attribute to 
networking very heavily is that yeah. ability to go, okay, I may not be an expert here, but I can jump into this conversation and I can, you know, and I think it makes you much more comfortable in saying, I don't know about that or I don't know because you see so many other people doing it around you. Yeah. Um, and I've always found that I, I, I always think back to the networking event at, at connect where we had to speak to people for like 20 minutes um (laughs) and everyone that i spoke to about something said oh i'm not sure about that at least once in the conversation um which i I think is i don't know encouraging shall we say yeah it kind of makes you feel like you're not the only one because sometimes when you get inside inside your own head and you start to think Mm. oh no i'm the only one that doesn't know about this and then you realize other people are the same you're like Okay, and it's only by doing that sort of networking piece that you will you will learn that about people because yeah. you know that that's the only way to find out about people, isn't it? To to mix and network. Absolutely. Um, on that note, um, I guess kind of we've had a couple of years of very very remote events, um, yes. and I think networking has has happened and I think it's mm-hmm. happened really well in, in in some situations uh but in terms of the impact that has how how have you seen it impact the quality or the amount of networking that people are doing and are you seeing that kind of improve or stay the same now that we're starting to get back into face-to-face events I think it's definitely improved now we're starting to get back into face-to-face I think the problem that you had was um, obviously it all happened so quickly um, mm. and we all had to shift and change really quickly and it was really foreign to everybody like everybody being on Zoom calls or Teams calls and you know almost doing that virtual network and it felt really odd because at least if you're in a room you can read off people a little bit better you can pick up on body language signals a lot better when you're physically with somebody but I think it's yeah. really hard when you're on a virtual event to actually Feel silences. They feel a lot more awkward when you're virtual. Um, and I think I think it got to the point was sort of two years of the pandemic that people almost had that. Well, they did. It was a thing. Zoom fatigue was a thing by the end of it. And I think everybody was kind of a bit a bit spent at staring at them little boxes of people. And it kind of felt like it was a bit laboured towards one point that you were almost having a networking event for the sake of having a networking event at that point. So I think it, it served its purpose and I think it's still mm. a viable way of, of networking. But I definitely think that now that face-to-face events are happening again, um, it's definitely having a positive impact. I mean, I fully remote work now, so I don't ever go into an office. So I, I constantly stare at people on the screen. So when I get the opportunity to meet up with somebody and work side by side, I love it. And it, it is, it does, it has such an impact. And it, again, it's that it's that networking piece is key. And I think it's that physical networking just makes such a difference because you can just you can just pick up on, on somebody's way of thinking a lot quicker, I think, as well. It's interesting. I, all, I always think back to like just random conversations that have turned into networking. Mm-hmm. Um, so things that I've walked past and gone, oh, what are you talking about? And you, 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 you can't do that in Zoom. No. It doesn't, doesn't work like that. You can't just peruse a corridor of Zoom conversations and go, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll go and join in. Um, I imagine if you could, though, that would just be crazy, right? Oh, You'd be popping crazy, into right? people's Zooms <laughs> left, right and centre. It'd be, it'd be crazy. Yeah, it's fine to see you wandering on a disciplinary and then you're like, oops, I'll, uh, I'll come back later. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not this one. <laughs> no, this is it. But uh, yeah, I, I think, and I've seen like some attempts to replicate like natural networking um on, on on platforms things like water cooler and places like yeah. that but even then it's a it's a conscious effort to have to go right i'm going to log into networking for 20 minutes now yeah and it, it just loses that spontaneity that i think allows allows you to find people that you just have that connection with um that i think it really mm. helped build careers oh massively and it's it's like you say it's just that walking past the conversation it's like oh oh, what's that that sounds really interesting I want to you know I want a piece of that I want to learn more about that and it it is that natural it's that natural human instinct isn't it to be with people um I mean don't get me wrong I like I like to be on my own on vacation that is quite (laughs) nice having three children it's a beautiful thing to be on my own um (laughs) but it is I, I do like the sort of interaction of people and you do miss that sitting in front of a screen it's it's definitely not the same 
No. So I kind of touched that there, but um, the impact on a career that networking can have. And I feel like this is sometimes the thing that gets a little bit overlooked in networking. Mm -hmm. We talk about how it makes us, you know, um, well-rounded or how we learn new things or how we increase our network, which is kind of self-fulfilling within the idea of networking. (laughs) But in terms of your actual career development, I mean, I know it's impacted mine massively, but what what role has networking played for you? Um, It's played a massive role because I think without networking and without mixing with different people, I would never have found a mentor. And I think that's that's a big thing that I found to do networking and being mentored in a Mm. specific sort of career aspiration almost because my aim was always to... I always wanted to climb the ladder, but not to like dizzy in heights where I was like super boss of something. That's not my bag at all. But I always wanted to progress my career, um, especially when the children grew up. I wanted it to be something that for me. So I think having the ability to be mentored and to also mentor somebody else as well, um, Mm. because I've been on both sides of the fence. And I think both have played such a key role in, in my career because um, being mentored has given me clear focus of what I want to do, what I want to achieve and how to get there. And then mentoring somebody has helped to sort of hone in on my skills and develop them further by learning off somebody as I help them through their journey. Um, so, yeah, it's massively played a big part in my my sort of career, even to the point of um, attending events because what's, mm. what that's then done is speaking to all these different kinds of people, it's built my confidence up and it's almost um, made me feel like I do know what I'm talking about and I can prove that in, you know, by, by sort of progressing in my role and bringing new ideas to the table. And I never would have had that confidence to bring new ideas to the table before. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's played a massive role, massive that's awesome. I, I I know for me, certainly for my own business, like I would probably say 80% of our client base is gained through networking by me yeah. and the team. It, it And that the, the connections you make with people that I think are, I don't know, longer lasting, like they tend yeah. to be the clients that come back. Um, so I think certainly if you're a freelancer, it's uh, incredibly invaluable, but you almost want to start before you take that jump. Um, yes. and don't be playing catch up um, you know I think quite often when we hear the how do I get my first client or how you know how do I speak to hiring managers um, the uh, sort of my advice is always as simple as kind of well speak to them like it's kind of yeah. in, the, in the question you've if you don't go and say hello my name is <laughs> this is what I do and what do you do and the, the, the questions you, you're never going to start the conversation they all start the same yeah. way it's just being I think uh, we kind of discussed it, confident, brave, whatever the sort of right term is. I guess it's different for each person to go and open that conversation. Yeah. Um, so in terms of kind of looking forwards, um, what what do you sort of look out into the space specifically of networking at this point and sort of see, oh, this we need more of this? And what do you maybe think? Is there anything that you think, oh, I'm not sure that's actually helpful? Not sure that's actually helpful. That's uh, an interesting <laughs> one. That um, I think looking out into the future, I definitely think because it's still it's still building up. I still think the face to face pieces are key. I think thinking of face to face things and stuff that doesn't work. I think forced events it's almost to the point where you've got like a full on schedule and you're going to be talked at for a full day about that and although some of that is really useful I think moving forward now we need to start looking at it as a piece where you can almost learn from each other and you can almost um build your knowledge sort of not in a forced way so I think I think that's the the way I'd like to sort of look future focused is is to sort of move away from networking events that are very structured, very stringent, very agenda-led, and get them to be more relaxed, something where you can almost free flow around a room and you can, it, it makes it sound like I'm creating a speed date, dating event right now, but that's not where I'm going. <laughs> more of it, so you can learn off each other, so you can see people in a room and go, right, okay, I know they're an expert on X, Y, and Z. 
I want to go and speak to them and I want to learn about that. Almost so that it's driven by yourself in in that sense. So that that's where I'd like to see networking moving more towards. And that that's you know, that's what I enjoy, I think. And I think a few people would that I've spoken to before they'd like that free flowing kind of networking space. Yeah, I think I think again it kind of goes back to the last couple of years where everything has been very constrained. Mm. Like it's been our best approach to or our best attempt to mimic real life online. Yeah. Um and now people kind of aren't interested in that constraint anymore. So um let's ima- imagine a world if you can. Imagine. <laughs> um I, I, I've never networked before, or I'm very nervous about networking, and maybe I've, you know, I've not done that well with it before. I'm going to start again. I'm starting this week. What are the kind of top tips that you would give someone in that scenario? Okay, top tips. Do my research, so I'd see what actual official networks are out there that suit sort of your mindset and the sort of things you want to build knowledge on the sort of aspirations you've got so I do my research first and find find an actual network that you can become a member of so to speak mm. um I guess for me when when I started on my networking journey um the first step that I did was I got a mentor and I think that's that's really good because that gives you a purpose and that's starting small Networking with somebody that you you know you wouldn't necessarily have met before because you've been partnered, but based on sort of your needs and wants and what that person can give you. So start small and definitely look for a mentor. Just go to events, even if you just sit on the sidelines and observe for the first couple. I think it doesn't matter. I think just as long as you can see how they work and kind of. Paint a picture in your head how you see yourself fitting into those events moving forward. And then I just think you've got to be bold. You've got to you've got to just really grab the opportunity and just throw yourself into it. I think that's the only way that you can sort of really truly get involved in sort of networking and, and again building your confidence up. So I definitely I definitely take those tips as as a starting point. And then I think from there. The more you do it, it's like anything. The more you do it, the more you practice getting involved in it, the more natural it becomes. And then you'll just wonder what the fuss was all about in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like this. So, because I mean, here in the UK, for instance, it's a great time to be starting doing exactly this and getting to events. We've got so many coming up. Uh, obviously, we've got what we've got coming up. We've got World of Learning. We've mm-hmm. got uh, the Learning Technologies Autumn Summit. Um, we, of course, have the Learning Network Connect approaching in November. Um, in the States, there's DevLearn just around the corner. Yeah. Um, I'm very sad that I can't go to it. I'm a little bit grumpy, but that's fine. <laughs> um, that's, uh, but, yeah, I think there's, although now there's lots of events on the horizon, there's always something. I guess yeah. is the uh, is the approach to take. There's you don't want to be delayed um, too long waiting for an event, but now is a very good time specifically. I guess yeah, and those conferences, there's things yeah. like Learning Tech and World of Learning. They're a great place to start because yeah. although they're very busy and there's a lot going on, it's kind of your choice as to whether you want to go and speak to people. But it's just being in in the throw of it and seeing those conversations happen. I think that's a great place to start for sure. And I find in a lot of the places as well, a lot of the best, you know, quote unquote networking that I do is actually away from the real hubbub. And it's in the areas where people stop for a coffee. Yes. Um, Because you're going to have to share a table because there are never enough. Let's just put that out there straight away. Never (laughs) enough chairs, never enough tables, Um, which is kind of a good thing in many ways, um, because it sort of makes you rub shoulders, maybe have a conversation. Um, even if it's just about, you know, what, what, what are you looking for? What have you found today? Or, you know, have, you, always... has, have so-and-so tried to sell you their thing yet? Because clearly <laughs> yeah. they're going to try to sell it to everyone that walks in the door. I it's, always uh... um, find it's whatever freebies you've managed to blag from each of the stands mm. is a great starting conversation. Because if you see somebody with a load of swag and you think, I want some of that swag, that's a great place to start a conversation and boom, you're networking already. This is it. It's uh, and certainly for me, I found I found like having the um, the 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 QR thing yes. for um, uh, for LinkedIn. 
uh, on your phone where you can come yeah. and go, oh, here's the QR for my LinkedIn, mm-hmm. grab that. You know, it, it moves it away from the human element a little bit, mm-hmm. but it means you've not lost that connection the moment you leave the um, sort of leave the um, convention or, or conference. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't, it, uh, otherwise I think you end up in that, oh, I'll just look for my name. And no matter how rare you think your name is, <laughs> there will be some other people with it, I'm afraid. Yes, um, yes, that's true. Because <laughs> I always thought, oh, well, McDowell, it's not that common a surname. It's common enough to not be that searchable on LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, Who knew? So, so, exactly. This is it. So I quickly learned that one. Um, so stepping outside of just networking then um into the into the broader realm of L&D um i always like to ask people uh, a couple of questions first of all what what are the, what are the sort of projects that you're working on at the moment that you're really enjoying and are seeing a really big impact from uh, well i guess in the world that i work in of apprenticeships everything in the world of apprenticeships is it's just so enjoyable because you're just giving somebody an opportunity to be able to progress themselves be that in a in a job that they're already in uh the beauty of things like boot camps giving people opportunities that ordinarily wouldn't have those opportunities um so i think in, in the world of lnd that i sit in most projects that i get to work on um I, I just love because you could just see the difference that it's making um so yeah that that's that's huge for me i just love seeing the opportunities being grabbed by people it's interesting because I, I, I find that there's this is not necessarily overlooked, but we don't talk about it enough in the L&D space. Because I find when we have these conversations, quite often people love what they do, not because of how clever they get to be or how they get to apply the science that they've learned, or the learning mm. theories or any of this stuff, or even like winning awards. It mm. tends to be that kind of joy we get out of those aha moments or the success of others that we facilitate. Yeah. Um, and I, I sometimes wonder, you know, when we sort of sell the dream of working in L&D, we talk a lot about, um, you know, working conditions and the excitement of the role and pay and all the all these other great things about working in L&D. But I think it's nice we miss that one. Yeah. Um, it's uh, I, I guess because it's kind of intrinsic to who we are, maybe, as opposed to what the role is. I don't know. Possibly. Um, yeah, you might be onto something there. I, I certainly, I, I, I don't think I'd stick around if it wasn't there. That's that way. yeah. It's, it's the joy of doing, isn't it? It's the joy mm. that you know that what you're creating is going to make a difference. Then I think that's that's where the love for the role comes in, really, doesn't it? I, th- I think so. I think that's it. Yeah. Certainly, well, certainly in my experience, I'm sure someone will tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, that's <laughs> the upside of the internet, right? There's always someone who knows yeah. better. Um, <laughs> so uh, the final question that I ask literally everyone on the show, when you look at the L&D world right now, what are you really excited about? What do you think? Yes, I can't wait to see more of this. And what maybe not so much? What are you looking at and thinking, oh, I wish... You know, I wish this was different or I wish this wasn't getting the traction that it is. Can we start with the what I wish wasn't getting the traction? Because that's easy. <laughs> Everyone I, wants to start really with that one. And yes, we can. I really hope I don't upset people now. But this is just my personal opinion. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, learning styles seems to be rearing its uh, little head again <laughs> lately. And it upsets me. <laughs> upsets me mm. greatly. Um God, we could do a whole episode on learning styles and my hatred of it. But yeah, I wish that would kind of simmer down a little bit because I just feel like it's very archaic and it's not the right way to look at how people learn and ways of creating learning to help people. And it, yeah, so that seems to be rearing its little head. It does this though, it goes in full cycles Mm -hmm. where it raise its little head to the surface again, somebody brings it back into the situation and then it, it dies down again because everybody says, no, stop that now. So, yeah, that's one thing that I wish would just end now. So sorry so, if I upset anybody on that front. No, no, I think if, if anyone's upset by that, this probably isn't the show for you, um, any more than it is for Apple users or flat earthers. Um, <laughs> that's, With you. <laughs> so... Um, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, that and other sort of 
uh, it's kind of cyclical misunderstandings that mm. sort of I know, uh, for instance, I always tell the story like when I when I joined the industry like 10 years ago, I was like, right, I'm going to take all these courses from a very big, well-known body that uses purple letters for their logo um, mm. and was sort of taught learning styles, super important. Yeah. They're science. They must underpin everything you do. Yeah. Whoops. And it kind of set me off on this really bad course. Um, where it sort of, I always sort of say I wasted the first two years of my career talking nonsense and yeah. then until finally people were like, no, no, seriously, here's what the, here's what it actually doing. Um, yeah. and, and that, that it kind of, if ever there was a moment where I was like, this career is not for me, that was going to be it. It's like <laughs> yeah. everything you learned is wrong. Start again. It's like, ah, uh. and I always <laughs> now wonder, is that where it keeps coming back? Because when you naturally get a new kind of, maybe not generation in, in terms of age, but the next generation of people yeah. moving into L&D, are we still giving them the same baseline information that is awful as a starting point? You might be um, onto something there. Because I'm thinking that that's, there's a possibility that that is what's happening and that's why it keeps coming full circle and, and coming back into the forefront again. Because I think we're we, collectively as an industry, I think we're pretty good at challenging ourselves yeah. once we're fully immersed. But if you're just at that walking in the door stage, mm. we're, I think, uh, certainly I find I'm more hesitant to really challenge someone who goes, it's my first day or my first <laughs> week in the job. You're like, uh, now is probably not the time to rip apart everything <laughs> you say and do, is it? Um, <laughs> let's get your coat off first and then we'll start that. Um, but. Yeah, I think maybe there's that hesitance there, um, or maybe just we're not we're not. You know, I'm, maybe that's not the case. Maybe I'm just uh, looking looking for a good excuse for bad practice. I don't know, but um, I'd certainly agree with you that we need to, in some way, we clearly need to work harder to finally get it gone. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, so it was easy for me to pick one that I'd quite mm, like no, to get yes. rid of. Um, what would I like to see? I think for me. And this has sort of come about recently. I think there's still, for us, there's a lack of um, almost like a p p profession for us. So like having those qualifications, those solid, especially in the design world, the solid designer qualifications, skills, that professionalism of what we do. So I'd love to see that start to, to it started to take traction and it started to, to pick up, I'd love to see that sort of really move forward and really sort of take off and somebody to pick up and run with that. Because I think there are there are qualifications that you can do. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there's nothing out there, but I think to have a well-rounded sort of professionalization of what we do would be quite nice. And I think then you've almost got that benchmark because there's never really a benchmark for you to measure yourself against. I mean, you can look at people that have won um, awards, for example, which is a great way of, of sort of looking at how you sort of measure up to what people are doing. You can even see people doing like challenges online, at a well-known website. Um, and you can almost look at them and go, mm. I could do better than that. But that's just in your head. That's just you benchmarking yourself. But if there's that standardization of a benchmarking, like there is in a lot of careers, it kind of mm -hmm. gives you a guideline as to where you are and what you need to improve on. So I think I'd love to see that sort of really kicking off moving forward. Yeah, it's, it's funny actually. Me and uh, me and Joey on the idea update spoke about this in the last episode, yes. and it's <laughs> initially I thought, oh yeah, indefinitely. We just we need a body. They need to be universal. They need to do this. And as I kind of listed what it needs to be, I was like, oh, this is not a small thing. No, like, it's this huge. is huge. <laughs> um, like I, I guess because as you say, in in certain industries, it's just always been in place. Yeah. Um, I'm sort of thinking uh, accounting. Um, mm. you know, the the kind of medical space everything is very if you have this you can be the following roles yeah if you don't have this you cannot do the following things um even like it's funny i thought i was thinking even like this personal training and fitness space has exactly. more professionalization than we do i exactly. remember speaking to a i was creating some content for like a personal training training company and mm. they were like you cannot talk about nutrition because they're not allowed to talk about it they're not they're not qualified to talk about nutrition they can pass on government advice but they can't formulate plans because they're not 
do- they're not I can't remember it's nutritionalist or there's another word for it but you wow. have to do a separate qualification for it so I'm thinking we do not have that stringent stuff in L&D no. but that's a really lot interesting us, a lot of us kind of learn as we do I mean I know that's true for me I kind of oh, yeah. I never went on any like formal course I kind of got given articulate to and went off your pop, learn how to do that. It's like, right. okay, yeah, I'll, I'll have a bash at it. And that's literally how I've developed, just by learning, going on webinars, sort of teaching myself almost. So, and I think that's how a lot of us have kind of developed our careers. So you, you're completely right. I think there is, it is a massive, massive task. And because it hasn't always been there, that's why it is so big. But it'd be really nice to sort of see that, starting even and i guess part of the challenge now is because it's so established and so much of the industry is self-taught how do you then accredit a predominantly self-taught industry yeah that because does someone with 30 years of really solid experience continual growth constant practice who doesn't have a bit of paper do they suddenly become unqualified for the role or it, it's very tricky, isn't it? It is. It's a tough line, isn't it? Because you almost don't want to tell that person that's been in there that long. Like, You're not really up to scratch. I think you need to take it back a step. But yeah, it's, it's a tricky I, I, one. I'm less worried about those people. If someone's not up to scratch, I think we need to be more. I, but I think L&D does in, in certain areas and in certain industries and in certain businesses has an awful reputation. Mm. And a yes. solid part of that is because people, whether they've been in the role 20 years or 20 minutes, just exhibit bad practices and don't help yeah. the business move forwards. Um, and I think that the one reason I'm sort of so I so heavily agree with you with accreditation is the fact that if we were all held to that standard, we would all actually benefit from it because our yeah. industry would be held in much higher value and esteem by others if we could say, no, no, this is the standard. And if you yeah. hire a person with X, Y, and Z, you are getting that standard. Yeah. Um, Less of a sticking plaster, mm. like area of the business and yeah you almost feel like as well you almost feel like you, as an L&D practitioner you'd almost feel like you'd be taken a little bit more seriously as well with the solutions that you're given because a lot of how many times as an L&D practitioner have we experienced oh just send it to L&D they'll sort it they'll make it look pretty will not get on an e-learn that'll, that'll sort it everybody will totally understand it if you put it on a on a e-learn that takes 40 minutes to do and, and it is that's how we're regarded but if you've almost got that standard you've you've kind of got more sort of weight behind you you push back almost and yeah 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 so no i'd love to see it but you know it's not going to happen overnight not for not for a while no, I think someone's got to put a lot of time and a lot of money. So, challenge to everyone out there. Make <laughs> I, it I haven't got that, uh, so it's definitely no, no, not me. Thanks, you're not it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We'll just push that problem to someone else. This yeah. is this is the one you can't send to Ireland. <laughs> it needs to be someone else. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for making the time to to come and chat. It's been really interesting. Loads of really great takeaways. Um, if people want to get in touch, where can where can they find you? Where's the best place to chat with you? Um, so, well, I'm on all of the socials, so I've got a LinkedIn profile. Um, you can connect with me through the learning network. That's the last time I'll say it, I promise. Um, but I'm more than happy to sort of anybody reach out on both those channels. And, and yeah, connect with me. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Ideas Podcast. All the information on how to get in touch with Gemma and about the Learning Network is in the description of this episode. Before you go, please do consider subscribing and liking this episode and, of course, letting us know in the comments what you're taking away, what you're going to put into action, or if you have any thoughts on networking in the L&D profession.